Hello, and welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a British and an American perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be relatively normal people. And we do this one topic at a time. We are me, Benjamin de Campos, a designer and believer, and Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and devil's advocate. Jeff? Good evening, everyone. Uh, we choose topic of interest. We spend a little time researching it. We have a discussion, which is what we're doing right now. Um, and then we publish the notes, which if you like, you can go and review, read, read along with the show. And they are on our website, which is eclecticist.co.uk. And we do this to foster a greater understanding of the world before we die and hopefully to prompt further thought and discussion from our listeners. The topic of this episode is Scottish cuisine. That's Scottish cuisine. Jing's Crivens, help me bobe. Have we got a bra topic for ye, Jimmy? If we were to reduce a country down to a few specific food items, Scotland would be haggis, porridge, and mutton. There are probably others, and we may mention them in the show. Shortbread, for example. References to Scottish cuisine in the media will almost certainly be derisory, often for comic effect. The native's penchant for deep frying is a particularly familiar canard, but there is a serious tone when talking about Scotland's habit of combining a terrible diet with their tradition of getting dangerously drunk all the time. The BBC reports that Scottish mortality rates among working age men and women have been the worst in Western Europe since the late 1970s. But hey, maybe it's worth it. I don't think we're going to be talking about scaled down supermarkets and upmarket petrol stations uh, during this conversation. No. So this is a rather unusual topic. Um, and I kind of uh, was joking when I suggested doing this. But um, and I think you knew I was joking. <laughs> maybe you saw some kind of potential in in interest in talking about something like Scottish cuisine. It might be the kind of thing that not many people talk about. It certainly wasn't that easy to find out about it. And what actually inspired me in the first place to suggest this is a show topic is a, a recent news item here in California about how haggis is now legal to manufacture here in California because you can't actually import haggis you have to actually make it in the U.S., which just sounds crazy. Is there that much of a, or that big, a, a Scottish expatriate community that um, there is a demand for haggis? Do you know why you cannot import it? It might be to do with the reason why it was illegal to make it here. So, something about the casing, using a sheep's stomach it might have been illegal. <laughs> I'm not sure. Strange. It certainly was the case that it was illegal to import haggis. I mean, that's quite discriminatory because, you know, there are lots of, uh, lots of concentrations of uh, other cultures in California. It's very multicultural. You know, they, they don't, they don't stop uh, eating, you know, importing dogs for, for eating or, or horses or, or snakes or, you know, uh, jungle meat, but why stop a haggis? That's peculiar. Anyway, so the interest, I the thing about most of the topics that we think of, usually the motivation is because we don't feel we know enough about whatever the topic is. And certainly, I have a lot of experience with eating in Scotland, but I don't really know that much about Scottish cuisine. It's certainly something I would like to learn a little bit more, and I think I have. So I think we should start with the history. Now, Scot Scotland is, for people who don't know, is a country that is part of the United Kingdom. It's at the top of an island. Its latitude is really quite high. It's really right up there near Scandinavia. It's generally pretty cold. It's pretty rainy, windy, uh, dark, uh, and fairly miserable when it comes to weather. It's, it's fairly terrible, in fact. Sometimes I wonder why anybody would want to live there at all. But then again, why do people live in Scandinavia? I mean, presumably the weather there is even worse. So not only is it cold, wet, and dark, but also it's really bumpy. So, you know, there are lots of hills and uh, mountains and basically undulating landscapes, which don't, uh, which aren't uh, particularly conducive for agriculture of seed-based 
crops. Uh, so generally speaking, there isn't that much agriculture and most crops are imported. Um, there is some, but not that much because it's a small country. And as I say, it's quite bumpy. So a lot of the cuisine really is anything that doesn't involve strict, large scale agriculture. So we're talking everything that comes out of the sea. So there is very, very long coastline. Uh, and the North Sea is very rich in fish and shellfish. Everything inland uh, in terms of game and whatever berries you might be able to pick off the bushes. And that's about it. And also, historically, there was quite a limited amount of trade between Scotland and the rest of the world. Spices and herbs, for instance, is something that never really made major inroads into Scotland and never really formed a part of the cuisine, whereas herbs and spices is fairly central to most other cuisines in the world. Um, so very little natural produce, you would think. And you would th also think if you've ever visited the highlands of Scotland, it would be impossible to live there because it seems so barren and so remote. I mean, it's like a wasteland. What could you possibly eat? Uh, this is what you may think, and it seems reasonable to think this. But the reality is there's an incredible amount of fabulous foods in Scotland, and they have a really rich cuisine full of wonderful, fresh components. It's amazing that the health in Scotland isn't the best in Europe. So this is the strange paradox, <laughs> which I find particularly interesting about Scotland. They have all this wonderful food, and yet the vast majority of the population seem to choose really low-quality foodstuffs, and their health uh, is uh, adversely affected by these decisions. And I just find that weird contradiction particularly right. interesting. Okay, all right. So I just looked up there about uh, haggis in, in California here, and there's an article in The Guardian, and it starts off saying, smuggled and bootlegged, it has been the cause of transatlantic tensions for more than two decades. But after 21 years in exile, the haggis is to be allowed back into the United States. Apparently, in, the reason was sheep. Sheep is illegal. Sheep meat. All right. Meat, meat from sheep. <laughs> meat, meat from sheep was illegal in California. The, uh, the other uh, source of this story, which I heard they were actually talking about, the sheep stomach element of haggis. But, and... Up until a few years ago, the only Scottish haggis that were available here in California had to be illegally smuggled in. And that's kind of what this article is talking about. This sounds like a, a queer Californian donkeys can't sleep in <laughs> bathtub sort of law. Yeah. It's got to be some sort of trade tariff related issue. Or... Uh, okay, well, we'll look into that. Unless there's a general ban on Oh, awful. no, it says, it says it here. Here we go. It's banned on health grounds by the U.S. authorities in 1989 because they feared its main ingredients, meat, uh, minced sheep offal, could prove lethal. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I mean, yes, it is mostly awful. Yeah. Uh, it, it includes things like, um, and basically it's the entrails of sheep with some spices, maybe a little bit of potato, stuffed into a sheep's stomach and mm. then boiled a lot yeah uh it's peculiar uh, you know i mean chopped up and boiled lung uh might not sound appealing but no. in the you know the end result the haggis itself when it's cooked well is very tasty you know it's a lot like uh black pudding or blood sausage as they say in america i mean that sounds terrible but uh you know it's an animal product like all the other animal products we consume and it's particularly uh tasty one Okay, so, yeah. well, well, we'll get into this in a moment. But I just also want to say up front uh, to our listeners that you and I, we can speak disparagingly about Scottish people. We can say whatever we want. We can be an insulting and horrible and, you know, Matt and Trey level insulty about Scotland and Scottish people. Because, Jeff, you and I, we are Scottish. We are Half Scottish, that's true. So we have the epaulets to disparage the Scots as much as we like. Total key to the city, free reign. 
Yeah, so we have probably more um, actual Scotland experience than most people. Our mother was Scottish and all her family is Scottish. They obviously had the good sense, or most of them had the good sense to get the hell out of that place and move down south to civilization. Over the years, we have spent numerous holidays, if you could call it that, in Scotland, and we've experienced Scottish food, if you can call it that. Which, which I find quite interesting, because again, my experience of food in Scotland is that it's outstanding. Okay, well, let's talk every, about that. Every meal I've had is fantastic. Well, first of all, let's just have, let's just list some of the highlight foodstuffs that are available and, and are exported from Scotland. Okay. They include, so there, there are tectonically formed lakes in Scotland called lochs. So they are very deep, very clear water, very fresh, and they are teeming with fish. They're teeming called, with monsters, Jeff. All, all, well, teeming with one monster, I suppose. Teeming with monster. Um, which is not just restricted. That monster travels between Loch Lomond and Loch Ness. There's a sort of communication underground tunnel that it swims through. That's why it was never found when they did the sonar drag. Uh, not a lot of people know that, but it's it, it lives in both locks. Anyway, uh, along with the monsters, there are plenty of fish, loads of trout. You know, sp- sp- particularly salmon is... Um, you know, what Scotland is known for. The salmon is outstanding. We have, of course, the whiskies, all the single malt, extremely expensive whiskies produced from Speyside to all around um, Scotland. We have, uh, of course, beef, Aberdeen Angus beef, which is, you know, one of the higher quality uh, animals uh, in the world for beef. Uh, lots of root vegetables and turnips and, you know, anything that's buried under the ground that isn't destroyed by the weather. Uh, we have things like uh, Arbroath Smokies. So they are world class smoked fish, among many other different types of smoked fish. Uh, lots of interesting things with potatoes in them, particularly potato scones. Um, Porridge, uh, you know, extremely, uh, if not the inventor of porridge, then certainly very famous for its porridge. Uh, pies, um, traditional Scottish breakfast with uh, black pudding mm. and potato cakes. And it, it, it's a long list and it goes on, but, uh, no, you know, the venison no, is, is world Keep class. Going. Venison? Scotland venison, is known for venison? Venison. Yes, absolutely. There are more deer in Scotland than there are Scottish people. So the venison is the absolutely fabulous. Right. Lots of fresh ingredients, uh, very available. You know, it's it's there. It's it's there for the taking. But for some bizarre reason, I guess it's not, and it's not just restricted to the cities. But people tend to eat sort of high fat, high sugar, highly processed foods. Uh, and it's not a poverty thing. I mean, you know, the, the wealth index is, is certainly not at the very bottom of the table. But uh, it's just, I suppose maybe it's the darkness, it's the bleakness, um, it's the weather. Maybe it just makes you think inward rather than outward. And right. you, know, you don't get so many people venturing out to uh, kill a deer. Well, not kill a deer, but to seek fresher foods uh, when, you know, you have more convenient foods available with less effort, perhaps. I mean, I'm just guessing here, but it just strikes me as odd that whenever I go to a restaurant, and it doesn't have to be a posh restaurant in Scotland, the food is actually really excellent. I mean, they have 13 Michelin-starred restaurants currently uh, in Scotland, such a small country, and yet, you know, they're really known for their gastronomy, generally speaking. Uh, but, uh, but I have experienced the lower-quality foods uh, in Scotland, and uh, one of those is the Scotch pie, uh, which is very low quality, and I think it's a bit awfully as well, uh, but very tasty. And you, you, this is this is all you ate for quite a significant portion of your childhood, I seem to remember. I don't think it's awful, unless my understanding of awful is slightly different. It's it's mutton meat, and it's pie, and that's it, as in as in pastry. Yes, awful is. Like the entrails. The entrails. The yeah, I yeah, don't think exactly. there's any guts in there. Or at least maybe there is. <laughs> but I'm yeah, you're sure. right. I, I know I know that the, the faggots have they're awfully. Um, so do you want to definitely. explain that? I mean we don't use words like that anymore, Jeff. A faggot is Yeah, Jeff, careful. There are two there are two definitions in the UK. W- one one is a sort of a um brazier full of 
flammable materials like wood and paper that you set light to, like a torch or a beacon. All right. Uh, the other one is a, a meatball, basically. But it's a meatball that I think is mostly, the constituents of these meatballs are mostly awful and maybe sort of bread or grain. Jeff, I, I thought a faggot was also a, a bunch of sticks tied together. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it's usually to burn, like a, a beacon. Right, okay. But these ones are uh, meatballs, but they're awfully, awful meatballs right. uh, in that they are made out of end trails and a little bit of bread uh very tasty let's pick up on that because i just want to ask you a little bit more about what you said earlier you said or you made it quite clear to our listeners that you have eaten haggis yes and not only that you enjoyed eating haggis indeed yes it's very tasty i highly recommend a really good haggis i mean you can buy them in the uk you can buy haggis anywhere you know they sell them in supermarkets usually they're frozen it's very difficult to get a fresh haggis unless you make it yourself but there are some specialist butchers who will do it for you in the south i think they're a little bit more commonplace in scotland as you might imagine um but they they are quite spicy uh they are very tasty i mean i think most other cuisines would consider them to be overcooked, and I think this is generally a problem, or certainly a perception of Scottish cooking, is that they kill everything by overcooking it, especially vegetables. Vegetables are all destroyed, uh, famously in neeps and tatties, which is a dish of just turnips and potatoes mashed together, um, which is very popular, but of course, utterly overcooked. Uh, so that's a problem. So... Even though I mentioned earlier that Scotland is known for its gastronomes, it is also known at the same time for its terrible cooking. So, again, another strange contradiction. Uh, and I have experienced both. So, you do know that the vast majority of serial killers, their favorite food was haggis. I can imagine. I'm just guessing. That could well be true. I did a very scientific survey of uh, explaining what haggis is to my uh, American friends. And without hesitation, all of them kind of made a kind of screwed up face gesture at me and then got me to explain what it was to them again. And I kind of see where they're coming from. There's something so unappetizing so sounding about the contents of haggis, exactly what it is. And, and I, I also feel the same about uh, the blood sausage, as you said. But, you know, both of these things have their fans. But that doesn't deter you. You're, you're not squeamish at all when it comes to uh, the ingredients to haggis. Well, the thing about haggis is generally it's not, it's not very processed. It's not heavily processed. It's a fairly manual procedure to assemble one and well to cook the components and then assemble it and then cook it again mm -hmm. and it's all you know i suppose you would say natural ingredients uh whereas fast food of any description contains who knows who knows how many chemicals who, who knows i mean uh, that's scarier for me in that you really don't know the derivation of most of the components whereas in a haggis you really do know exactly what it is you just have to get you know, you just have to cross the Rubicon of eating end trails, which which we all traditionally have. I mean, I grew up eating um, liver and bacon and onion. Uh, liver is, you know, is fine. I think liver, and we should probably um, we should probably research this and uh, see if there's any quantitative data on this. But liver, I think, is falling out of favor in the West, and I think. Whereas I think it used to be very popular. Similarly, kidneys, I think, may also be falling out of favor. Whereas I think they used to be extremely popular. I mean, certainly now you can still get steak and kidney pie. But I think generally speaking, um, the squeam factor is coming in and people are thinking, you know, I, I just, I don't mind if something says it's just beef. It's 100% beef. I don't care how processed it is and how, how stretched that defini definition might be. Uh, at least it's not something that, you know, Sounds bizarre, like lung. Mm. But the fact is, these are tasty parts of an animal, and I, I highly doubt they're wasted. You know, so in the whole world of slaughtering fifty trillion animals a day, I think 
not much of those animals are completely wasted and they all all the components of the animals find them find their way into the uh into the food supply for humans in one form or another haggis is just balls out this is what i am deal with it i mean you mentioned their squeam factor and i certainly have a lot of squeam factor in me and i told you that how i basically had a kind of psychotic break when i was eating some rotisserie chicken and i it just I don't know. It just hit me what it was I was doing with my mouth. And my, my tongue was feeling and palpating this muscle tissue and pulling it off of a bone of an actual animal. And that's why when, when stuff is heavily processed and minced to the point where it's just paste, <laughs> that doesn't seem to bother me as such, which is totally paradoxical, you know, as you say. Uh, but yeah, I, I can't get past just the label um, when it comes to things like haggis and blood sausage and all this other stuff. Um, I just want to touch on what you said about the lower quality food of Scotland. A um, friend of mine, an Italian man, and like all Italians, he's a kind of food snob. He was talking about his trip to Scotland. Oh, I just came back from Scotland. Oh, how did it go? And obviously he would start talking about food. And he gave them a lot of credit for perfect fish. He said, this fish was amazing. Fish was amazing, but everything else he just trashed. And then he became inconsolable when he was recounting this time in Scotland when he saw that this fish and chip shop was selling deep fried pizzas. Yes. So <laughs> Scotland has been known for a borderline fetish with deep fat frying various foods. It most famously was um, derided for frying uh mars bars these are to begin with very low quality chocolate confectionery products uh and to f- fry them in fat and oil uh, and then serve them up sounds absolutely delicious actually i'd really like to give that a go <laughs> it does sound uh, delicious. but i've never had the opportunity now i in my youth used to really uh enjoy fritters so these are very popular in scotland and generally they are anything deep fat fried, I suppose, qualifies to be called a fritter. So really, it's a Mars bar fritter. I like pineapple fritters. So these are um, ring pineapple rings that are just dropped in a deep fat fryer and, and battered. Uh, and, and it's fantastic. I tell you, when I would have a deep fried Mars bar, maybe a collection of them, I'd probably have a deep fried Mars bar. Maybe I'd have a deep fried Snickers bar. They do those as well, apparently. And I might have something else deep fried, who knows. But I would eat those if I was on death row and I was going to be hanged the next morning. That would be your choice for your final meal. Yeah, I mean, it, it just doesn't matter the implications of eating those at, at that point in my life. Well, um, in addition to p- low quality chocolate confectionery being dropped into a vat of uh, boiling oil fat, <laughs> uh, there are is a peculiarity called the Scottish sausage. Oh, yeah. So this is odd. This is effectively, it's a... Loaf cuboid. of meat. A, yeah, a cu- <laughs> loaf of meat. <laughs> exactly. It's a cuboid of sausage meat that is not... It, it's not encased in any kind of skin. It's just a cuboid of sausage meat uh, that is sliced into sort of little French toast looking slices of pork sausage meat and usually it's fried or deep fat fried uh and it's really fatty and really low quality uh and i mean it varies you can get high quality scottish sausages of course but generally speaking they're really cheap in the supermarkets cheaper than anything else you fry them up and it's part of a traditional scottish breakfast and you know the because of the incredible amounts of fat in it, I suppose as humans, we do quite enjoy eating it. I mean, I find it, it's very tasty and you know, I can definitely do that once or twice a year. Uh, every single day, something that incredibly fatty, I can imagine, is severely debilitating to your ability to continue living. <laughs> and uh, I think this is the problem with the Scottish in that they really do eat super high fat foods and may- and maybe this is because it's dark it's cold uh and in colder climates you tend to want to eat more fat and you mm. you, you benefit from eating more fat right but that probably goes along with a lot of hard work as well i have an alternate theory to that i mean I, yeah i'm sure 
all of that is probably true. But they're also very heavy drinkers. Again, I'm generalizing, but there is some truth in that generalization. It's like Sc- Scottish people on the whole are hardcore drinkers. And I've got a feeling that a lot of that junk food and junk, junk food just comes with that sort of territory. They're either sort of hung over and just want that you know, high fat content breakfast or there it's in the evening and they're drunk <laughs> and they just want um, low quality food because they don't care because they're drunk. Um, and maybe they're drinking so much because of the things that you mentioned, the darkness, the rain, the cold, you know, their lives. The despair. Yeah, the despair. Um, basically everything. Yeah, I think there's something to that. Um, when it's cold and dark and raining, uh, you tend not to want to go out and enjoy the great outdoors and, uh, you know, go cycling or fishing or playing sports. Rather, you'll congregate in pubs or, you know, restaurants and, and eat and drink. This is the glorious utility of the drink. Yes. Um, but alcohol, we'll get to that. But, uh, yeah, it is quite a problem. And this is, this is borne out by the national health statistics. Uh, for sure, the Scottish... Uh, drink a lot and in excess of any of the other countries in the union. And generally, the most popular drinks are not the extremely high quality alcoholic beverages that Scotland is famous for. It's usually low quality beers and ales. Spesh. You know, yeah. And, you know, very high alcohol beverages. Uh, whereas, you know, just the, the top whiskies, the single malt single mash space-eyed whiskies or the Balveni whiskies. Uh, Glen Fittich. They're, they're incredibly good. I mean, really, fan- you didn't have to be into whiskey particularly to, to completely appreciate why these whiskies are, you know, renowned as the greatest um, spirits in the world. Uh, because they are. They're astonishing. And, of course, Scotland does a huge trade with the rest of the world in exporting all of these super high quality um, whiskies. And yet that's not really what people generally drink in Scotland. So that is very peculiar. I mean, you, you kind of prefer to get drunk on a really, really top quality whiskey than a very low quality alco pop or beer, but uh, that just isn't the case. So the food is there. The top quality food is available. I mean, yes, you'll pay a little bit more for, I mean, you know, like everything, you pay a little bit more for better quality, but it is actually available in Scotland. I mean, they really do have fabulous butchers and, uh, you know, game butchers and, uh, you know, you can get it, but maybe it's an effort. Maybe it's a cost thing. It just, it doesn't seem to be that popular. Uh, with the vast majority of the population. And this could be because of the the large welfare state in Scotland. I mean, they really do have a huge social support system in Scotland. And I think that could well be the problem in that you really don't need to work if you live in Scotland. I mean, there, there are going to be fewer jobs in Scotland because it's a smaller country uh, and it doesn't have much in the way of um, engineering or manufacturing, you know, at least not in the same scale to other countries. Although, again, that's kind of wrong because, of course, you have the shipbuilding industry, which I guess has, you know, it's diminished over time as shipbuilding has gone to the Far East and whatnot. But, uh, you know, there really are companies of excellence, uh, centers of excellence in Scotland that are producing you know, nuclear submarines, uh, uh, aircraft carriers and various aircraft and uh, you know i mean they, they're clever people the scottish we know this they've invented so much you know, there's a real history of academia in scotland and generally speaking their education is at a, at a higher standard than the rest of the uk uh, certainly the universities are you know well well regarded um and yet the statistics don't lie uh health wise it's it's pretty poor uh, you know, the poorest in the UK, for sure. And, you know, I, I bring up health because we think of, you know, you are what you eat and, you know, diet is such an important part of your your overall health outlook. Uh, and in Scotland, and the links certainly have been made with the diet. But 
There, I mean, for the National Office for Statistics, and I quote, there are slight variations in life expectancy between the constituent countries of the UK. English men and women have the highest life expectancy at age 65. Um, wow, that's terrible. I no, no, the life, expect- <laughs> the life expectancy, uh, that is to say, the life that you expect to have from the age 65 oh. being 16.8 and 19.6 years, respectively. Oh, that's not too bad, then. Minute, minute. Yeah, so you're looking in your 80s, basically, overall longevity. Uh, but in Scotland, it's significantly less. Uh, at 65, you're looking to for another 15 years if you're a man and 18.4 years uh, for a woman. So it's the lowest life expectancy at that age um, currently, you know, with current figures. There isn't that much in it, but there is a statistically significant difference between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Uh, And also major killer diseases seem to run at a higher rate in Scotland. Uh, The highest uh, rates of lung cancer, heart disease, strokes, and certainly alcohol and drug-related problems. And I think maybe some of this could be attributable to the weather and you know the, the darkness. Uh, it could be attributable to the, the lack of jobs and general employment, and also the, the, wealth, the size of the welfare state. Who knows? All of these things could play, play into it. Well, here's an interesting uh, little observation which is probably apropos of nothing, but I was just um, reading about an actor Scottish actor died. Can't remember his name. And I kind of, there was a link there which, which took me to the actor that played Taggart, and he sort of died. You know, both these actors died in their, their 50s. And an all part of the little death um, section of the Wikipedia page you know, mentions that, you know, a lifelong heavy drinker. And then last year, the Scottish leader of the Liberal Democrats, what's his name? Kennedy? Oh, yes. Yes. Char- Charles Kennedy. He, Charles uh, Kennedy. He, again, he was a lifelong lifelong drinker. drinker died from in his very 50s young age or whatever. Well, I mean, no, al- alcohol is cultural. Basically, it's uh, part of the Scottish culture. Drinking is part of the Scottish culture, and I again, I think it's because uh, people will congregate in pubs rather than congregate on the beaches. <laughs> this is because it's so dark, cold, windy, and wet all the time. Uh, it's inevitable, and uh, there are lots of. Uh, implications of this lifestyle that's basically driven by the weather um unlike the greeks uh the scottish uh, aren't just sitting in deck chairs on a hot beach uh, enjoying the beautiful vista uh, eating cheese and and olives well hang on a minute i'm, I'm going to interject there on scotland's behalf because scotland is actually quite a beautiful country when it's not raining all the time <laughs> That's right. Obviously, there's the problem. (laughs) That's the problem, I'm afraid to say. It is a really beautiful place, but unfortunately, the weather, that's the problem, the weather. Now, rain is incredibly inconvenient. I know generally we are meant to think of the rain as weather, and it's not bad per se. It's just the weather. Deal with it. Dress appropriately, and it's fine. The fact is that it's really inconvenient. It's inconvenient when you have water pouring down the front of your face. It's hard to do things. (laughs) Uh, so you really don't want to be outside exercising. You want to be inside. And if you're eating. going to be inside, <laughs> you're going to be drinking and eating. Uh, it just always struck me that we're not, the Scottish aren't eating and drinking the high quality f- produce that they yes. do have. Rather, it's the much lower quality, cheaper stuff. Uh, maybe maybe it's the, it's the, it's the fat, fat content. Here. Yeah, we, we've concluded that it's comfort food to make them feel better about their lives. I think it must be, because it's just such a bizarre dichotomy. Mm. Uh, it really is peculiar. And I can well imagine that visitors to Scotland will find that peculiar as well. To just think, wow, look at all these great foods. And yet everybody seems to be going to these lower end supermarkets and buying all of this processed stuff that's been imported. Uh, how, how bizarre is that? No, that is interesting. I mean, I actually didn't know that. I didn't know that um, Scotland had such a, a, a great name for food you know I, I i came to this podcast assuming that fish fine everything else no it's not yeah it's not just fish it's uh you know it's it's there are lots of famous dishes 
Cullen skink, for instance, and shellfish really fresh and fish. Yeah, you wouldn't think it. That, that's the yeah, thing. I didn't I think so, it. I, it's hard to know what the international perception of Scottish cuisine actually is. I, th- I think it is. I think anybody who knows anything about Scotland will think that the cuisine is poor. But anybody who doesn't know anything at all about Scotland will think the cuisine is fantastic. So it's, it's odd. Now, I, I would compare and contrast Scottish cuisine with Scandinavian cuisine. And I would immediately conclude that Scottish cuisine is vastly superior. It's much, much better than Swedish or Norwegian cuisines, as far as I've been able to tell. This is completely from my own point of view here. Uh, and yet... You can have a poor experience in Scotland food-wise, and you can have a great experience in Scotland food-wise. It really is completely up to how you plan your visit and where you go and who you speak to. Uh, There are just two sides of Scotland. It's as simple as that. And unfortunately, I think the the more negative side is the one that they're wearing on the fronts of their T-shirts to the rest of the world. And this is a great shame. It's a great shame. But at the same time, I say it's a great shame. They have a massive export business of food and, you know, their food goes everywhere. So perhaps Scottish cuisine really doesn't take place in Scotland any longer outside of the uh, the, the slightly better restaurants. Well, maybe. I mean, maybe at some point, if I'm suitably drunk and in the right set of circumstances, I might try some haggis, you know, based on based on your glowing endorsement of that crazy food particularly now that i can buy it here in uh sunny los angeles yes well there you go thank goodness it's legal uh, i would also recommend cullen skink yeah this i is saw that basically what, it's a what soup is that? it's a brothy soup uh it's basically a fish and potato creamy soup which is excellent um uh, the the smoked fish any smoked fish uh, in Scotland is fantastic. Uh, obviously, there's the salmon, which, you know, when super fresh and eaten locally is the best salmon you could possibly have. Uh, the venison is, again, outstanding, perfectly fresh, uh, really well exercised and uh, almost smoky in its lugubriousness. And any shellfish, absolutely outstanding. I mean, honestly... If you want to experience the best of Scottish cuisine, in my opinion, you would travel up the West Coast and uh, visit all the high points in the highlands, including the islands. So you have 10 million islands around Scotland, um, almost that many completely uninhabited, but a few of them are particularly interesting, like the Isle of Skye, uh, even Stornoway, which is really, really up there up north. Um but uh, there, there is so much to discover. And even though there is a Visit Scotland marketing campaign, I just don't think it really reaches where it needs to reach. And I think the tourism is really always centered around um, the various festivals that take place in the big cities. And those big cities being um, Glasgow and Edinburgh, uh, you know, Inverness and um, Aberdeen generally don't get too much of a look in. But uh They certainly all have something to offer. And uh, it's a really interesting um, uh, food quest that you can find yourself traveling on when you go to Scotland. And I think my recommendation would be to have an open mind and assume that the cuisine is fabulous in Scotland and then be either pleasantly surprised or brutally shocked by what you see. Yeah, Gordon Ramsay. I'm sure he's a Californian. He is Scottish. And where does he live? Oh, <laughs> I have no idea. In California. <laughs> oh, do you think so? No, I think he lives in London. Um, he, I mean, it, he runs a restaurant. He's the chef at Claridge's, I think, still, perhaps. Yeah, he's the one with the face full of wrinkles, and he shouts a lot. No, I think, like a good quality haggis, he's had quite a lot of filler, and he looks quite significantly different now. Oh, well, he, he's from Johnstone... Renfrewshire in Scotland? I've never heard of that place. Oh, yes. Uh, you drive through it to get to the Highlands. Oh, really? Okay. But he's an a-hole. But a great, a great chef. 
I think we've covered everything we intended to cover. It was interesting reading around uh, Scottish cuisine. There isn't actually much about Scottish cuisine apart from specific dishes and some sort of regional traditions. Um, There's that, and also the the infamacy. The for just reading here, the Scottish Scotland's reputation for coronary and related diet based diseases is a result of the wide consumption of fast food since the latter part of the 20th century. So it's, it's a recent phenomena. Yeah, by the sound, it, it. it's the the introduction of fat, highly proce- processed, uh, highly fatty fast foods, mm. and not doing enough exercise. Those two things are a problem, and that that's where heart disease strikes. So I think, you know, there really is a problem with going out and being active. Yes. I mean, obviously not, you know, there are lots of uh, Scots who are extremely active. You know, there's famous mountain climbers, um, triathletes, and you know, loads of sports personalities. And it's one of those things. But as a general trend, you know, if if Scotland were a single individual, you might ask him to put the tablet down, get up and do a few laps around the house. Mm. Yeah, the, ta- the tablet is in the thing that I was speaking about in the show notes. No, not that, not that super sugary um, rescue food that you have when you're lost on a, a mountain. Not that type of tablet, <laughs> which is just pure sugar. Right. Uh, a tablet is in a, a little computing device that you're consuming media on and not oh, performing any exercise. Mm. So, if that's all, and we've done a terrible injustice to scottish cuisine here not going on in depth about the various dishes but no i don't think so at all i think what we've done is actually kind of clear up a few misconceptions i think so or that's what you've done the next show we actually have decided upon the topic will be mobile phones so everything about mobile phones next time which you can find details on hang on for our american listeners cell phones cell phones indeed portable telephony devices uh next time details will be on our website that's eclecticist.co.uk where you can find a feedback form right at the very bottom if you have suggestions of your own and there are also details on all of our previous shows all the show notes and the uh the shows themselves the outro music of choice this week is again something that is out of copyright or royalty free so we don't get sued it's entitled Sky Coolin, and it's by Kevin McLeod. Uh, this has been made available under a Creative Commons license. It is really great, really traditional Scottish sounding music, but with a very contemporary sort of tone. Um, Sky, as in S K Y E, is one of those islands right at the very top of Scotland where there are many fantastic restaurants. You should seek it out. Uh, it's off the northwest of the Scottish mainland. Uh, the mountain range thereon is named Coolin. Uh, this is spelled C U I L L I N. I'm sure it's pronounced Coolin. So please enjoy, and we will see you next time. Good evening. <laughs>